So it was the end of a very long day. A lot of planning, a lot of preparation, a lot of equipment checks, a lot of double guessing. And it was about 8 o'clock at night, and I had a break. And I was going to be able to run home for a second. So I took off and ran to my house. And if you knew me, when I was assigned to 3rd Battalion 7 Special Forces Group, Republic of Panama, you knew two things about me. You know I was a triathlete, and you knew that I ran around the post with a red wagon with my two little boys in it and my wife. And family is everything to me. So I ran home to tuck my kids in, and give them a hug and a kiss, and put them in bed, read them a story, and say a prayer. And then we had a brand new, you know, newly arrived daughter. And she was only two months old. So I went in the room and picked her up, gave her a big hug and kiss, and you know, held her for a few minutes, then put her down. And then I spent a little time talking to my wife. And then together we went out into the living room and we moved the big dining room table. It was a military issue dining room table. It was made of steel and fiberboard and weighted ton. In between two walls, two concrete walls, put the mattress under it. And she escorted me to the door. And I said, when the shooting starts, get under the table. I said, grab the kids and get under the table. And she said, OK. And I put on my, my equipment and strapped my 45 across my chest and threw my M16A2 over my back. And we opened the front door, and we were standing there talking. And then black hawks and Chinook started coming in over the housing area. And the housing area started to rattle. And the 160th Special Operations Aviation Regiment landed across the street. And all of us in 3rd Battalion 7th Special Forces Group made our way to the helicopters. And everybody climbed in, and I got in next to Eugene Davenport, a guy I worked with, a great guy, and Victor Carrera, and Gene Wildman. And I took a seat, and I had been wearing a Sony Walkman, which if you're really young, you don't know what that is. <laughs> but I had this Sony Walkman on, and I had been listening to The Doors. And what was playing at that time was Riders on the Storm. And Eugene looked and he pointed at the headset, said, what are you listening to? And you know, the rumble of the, of the helicopter, you really can't hear each other. So I took off the headset and handed it to him. And as I handed it to him, the song switched to break on through to the other side. And he, he looked at it and got the, the load master and put it on the speaker. And it came on, and everybody was, who all? Game on! And the hero starts to lift, black off lifts off, she looks lift off, and the invasion of Panama was under the way. And as we flew into Panama City, the 82nd Airborne arriving via Uber, C-130 and C-141 at the time. <laughs> Ramps and doors drop, and they start to exit, and they're being greeted by this hail of fire. And the next 72 hours were an absolute blur. And it was really intense fighting for the first 72 hours. And then I was on an iguana 72 hours later, flying back. All of the Special Forces missions had been completed, and thank God he had been very successful. And after 72 hours, you're thinking about sleep. And I was on this black book that had an iguana. And an iguana is a camera system that you can observe the battle on the ground from the sky and kind of direct forces. And all of a sudden, we got called in for a medevac. And so these amazing pilots from the 160th managed to land this black hawk in the middle of Panama City. And we offloaded and unloaded the wounded and the medic. And there's not a lot of room in the iguana, so the guys who had just gotten off of it, really there was no room for us to get back on, or for all of us to get back on. And I turned around and I looked at these soldiers. And there was another thing about me, and that was that I have a paternal attitude towards soldiers. Right? I'm always like the big brother or the father. And I looked at these two young soldiers from the 82nd Airborne, and they must have been in the Army all of about a year. And I said, what's for dinner? And they just looked at me like, huh? And I said, what's the mission? And they said, we've got sniper fire, and we're looking for Noriega. 
And something about that situation made me pause. And I said, I'll accompany you. And they looked relieved. And the helo takes off, right? I said, I'll stay. The helo takes off. And I said, follow me. So we start skirting around these buildings, snaking all the way down to this headquarters. And you can hear the fire, right? But you don't know where it's really coming from. And you know, whenever you hear firing, it's unnerving because you, if you hear it, the good news is, if it was meant for you, you would have felt it first, <laughs> right? So you're still safe. But we managed to come around the corner, and we're skirting around the corner. I trip and I look down, and there's a Panamanian soldier, and he's laying on his back, and he's young, and he's got a crucifix to his lips. And the last thing he saw on this earth before he went out, well, the last thing he did was a prayer. And it really affected me. It only lasted a fraction of a second, but it stayed with me a lifetime. Because at that very moment, I met death. And I met death in a very personal way, that I knew he was present, and that he was going to accompany us, and that he wouldn't leave our side. But it was only a fraction of a second, and we got to the front of the building, and we come in. And as we get in the building, there's a guy directing folks. Take the roof, take the top floor, take the left floor. And he said, you guys, take the, take the top floor. And so everybody takes the staircases, and I said, hey, elevators work. Let's just get on the elevator. <laughs> and so we run into the elevator, and the elevator door closes, and elevator music comes on. <laughs> and it's like a really surreal moment, because you can hear the rattling of the building and the fire taking place, and we're on the elevator. And you know, elevator door is open, and it's game on, right? You jump out into the hall, and one of the, one of the young soldiers out there said, someone just ran into that door. So we barrel down the hall, and we get to the door, and unlike the movies, you don't kick the door in. I'm trying to stop. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> so we get to the door, we take a position along the side of the wall, right? You estimate which way the door opens, because that door usually opens with the wall, which means the opening is the opposite way. And so you open the door, and as soon as we open the door, we swing in, and there is this Panamanian soldier. And he's standing in the middle of the room, he has a machete in his hand. And I swatted down the rifles of the soldiers. I said, don't shoot, don't shoot. And I looked, and for whatever reason, at that moment, I knew that that man was afraid. And so I asked him for the machete. And I'm a fluent Spanish speaker, so he just said, give me the machete. And he hesitated. And I realized that while my soldiers had lowered their weapons, I hadn't. So I swung my weapon around and walked up to him and said, give me that machete. And he handed it to me. I handed it to one of the soldiers. So at this point, one of the soldiers realizes that this, he was standing in front of a desk, and the desk was in front of a door. And he says, there's someone behind that door. And I said, easy, easy. And I realized that he was guarding the door. So I asked him, said, who's behind the door? And at that moment, you could hear fire just clack, 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 clack. And he hesitated. And one of the soldiers was about to shoot through the door. And I said, no, wait, wait, wait. And I said, who's behind the door? And he said, my kids. Mm -hmm. I said, are they really children back there? And he said, yes. So the desk was big and heavy. He got on one side, I got on the other. We moved the desk. And again, I reach for the handle, right? And as I'm reaching for that doorknob, I'm hearing clack, 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 clack. And I'm saying, please let there be children behind this door, right? So I raise my weapon, I reach to the door, and I turn it, took a deep breath. Maybe I should have stayed on that helicopter. <laughs> <laughs> and I swung the door open. And when I swung the door open, I saw two little kids. And they came out. And they were no bigger than my own boys. And so they come out, I realized right away, you know, and daddy, daddy, it's his father. We all breathed a sigh of relief. Soldiers jumped into the hallway, screams all clear. 
And I look at him and I said, these are your boys? He said, yes. I said, do you love them? Yes. I said, you've got to go home. You've got to go home with these boys and you can't come back out into the streets. If you do, you're going to lose your life. So I said, take off your blouse. He had a military jacket on. Pulls off his blouse and pull his t-shirt out and unblouse his boots. Told one of the soldiers to get him to the safe zone. So the soldier escorted him out down the elevator to the safe zone. We finished clearing the building. We didn't find a site. And then we came downstairs to the ground floor. And at that point, they're off on a different mission, because it's the 82nd Airborne, and they were going building to building, house to house. And he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to make my way back to Albrook. I've got to get back to my unit. And he said, it was a good call up there. And he said, you know, no hero story, but it was a good call. And I looked at him, I said, you know, part of being a good soldier is the lives you take. It's also the lives you save. Thank you.